May this message lead you to a deep reflection on the processes and tools of self-transformation provided by the renowned Yogi Sadhguru. If you want to start your yoga journey with Sadhguru, click on the link in the description of this video and learn more. This needs far more deeper attention than just being handled as a profession. I think that sense of dedication and involvement, individual doctors might have grown into it, but still that's not there as a culture, that is not there. It should not be seen as a profession, that's what I'm saying. Yes, of course, monetary requirements are there, that will happen, that's a different thing. But first of all, it must be seen as a, a certain commitment and a certain privilege that you are able to either end or extend somebody's life is not a small privilege. Sadhguru, many years ago when my son was a little kid, he gave me a book written by Swami Vivekananda. He was describing how ancient gurus could communicate with each other thousands of miles away just by thought. It's essentially, it's like a modern internet, how one computer can communicate with another computer in US or Europe, anywhere. Do you believe that human mind can be trained to influence another human mind or people's mind who are far away just by tuning our mind to the right frequency. Can it be trained? Can we, uh, can we uh, uh, learn that art? You're trying to beat the cell phone companies. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just about the mind. See, when we say mind, the English word mind, is only generally referring to only the thought process. Thought process is the most surface element of your mind. I think because of European thought, we have given too much significance to the thought. In the yogic science, we do not attach any importance to what you're thinking about or feeling right now, because what can you think? Only the data that you have collected, you're recycling it. It's of no great consequence. Whatever is in the surface of your mind keeps rolling, that is not of any consequence. What you're thinking and feeling right now is very surface of mind. There are deeper dimensions of the mind. In Sanskrit language, there are many, many words to describe the different states of mind. But now there is one aspect of the mind, for lack of time and stuff, <laughs> I'll leave those things. There is one aspect of the mind which we refer to as chitta. Chitta is the innermost core of the mind which is your connection with what we are referring to as consciousness. If your chitta becomes conscious, if your chitta acquires a certain level of conscious control, if you acquire, now you have access to your consciousness. What we are referring to as consciousness is that dimension which is neither physical, nor is it electrical, nor is it electromagnetic, it is a quantum leap from physical to non-physical dimension. A non-physical dimension being the lap of the existence. It is the non-physical in whose lap the physical is happening. Physical is a small happening. In this cosmos, not even two percent or not even one percent is physical, rest is non-physical. This non-physical dimension, in the yogic terminology, we use a specific sound which is connected with that dimension, today it's all very highly distorted, we call this Shiva, that means that which is not. We, when we say Shiva, we are not referring to some man sitting up there. We are talking about a dimension which is not, but it is in the lap of this dimension, everything that is happens. So if your chitta becomes even mildly conscious, your ability to not only communicate an idea or a thought, even to deliver something is possible. Physically deliver something is possible. So is it a possibility? Definitely it is. Right now can we teach it to all these people? In theory, yes. But are they willing to work towards it? That's a question mark. One big problem is our education systems are such, we have glorified our thought.
to such a place, first to bring that down itself will take time. To make them understand the stupidity of their thought, it will take a whole lot of time. Because everybody thinks they're smart, but actually the smartest thing about most people is their phone. So because your thought process is just an outcome of the limited data that you have gathered. It doesn't matter if I have read the libraries of the world, still it is too limited compared to what it is, what the creation is. With all the scientific development, we still do not know how a leaf really works. We do not know how a single atom in its entirety we do not know with all the scientific exploration. So that that should be humbling enough for everybody to know that we hardly… we know how to use things, but we do not know what it is. It will take lifetime of attention to even grasp the fundamentals of what it is. So if people are willing to first of all understand like the whims of their heart, you just dismissed as dumb, <laughs> okay? <laughs> if they also understand the… the so-called smartness of their thought process and emotion is quite dumb, now it becomes easy. It becomes easy to train people that communication need… it's not like, now I want to generate this thought and give it to you, not like that. Things will happen to you before you think. What… what is best for you will simply happen to you even before you articulate in your mind. You don't have to ever think what you want to become, how you want to be. Life will just arrange itself. An intelligence beyond what you can contain in this bone box starts working for you and it'll work. You've heard of Ramanujam and others just opened a window with their Devi and he becomes that kind of a mathematician which is, you know, even today they're… after one century they're still trying to figure out what he said. And the, the mathematical calculations th that he gave is the backbone for describing the black holes in the universe. When he was there, there was no word called black hole, nobody knew there is such a thing. When we say black hole, what we are talking about is the curve of time and gravity, which is something modern science is battling with. He made mathematical background for that. As the curve increases, it… what is in existence, physical existence becomes non-existence. So this is what it is when we say yoga. You reduce the curve in such a way that what is largely physical becomes non-physical. Once it's non-physical, time and space is not an issue. Once time and space is not an issue, communication is simply there. <clears throat> About twenty years ago, Sadhguru, I received a check for one lakh rupees from a retired major from Indian Army. He just gave his name, he refused to… I, he didn't give his address. And he wrote a small note stating that the, the money I am giving you is too small for the path you have chosen. But God has his own mysterious ways of giving you the rest. It had a tremendous impact in what I thought what I wanted to do. Is it because there is something called cosmic forces which are constantly trying to help society and doing or it's something else which is uh, influencing people to do something which is beyond their means? See, uh, the ideas of something wants to help, something reaches out to you, I was… <laughs> I happened to be in you know, about four weeks ago I was in Los Angeles and I was staying with some people there. And uh, the bedroom was full of books, so I just picked up one of these books and so on. The author is saying, the core of the universe is love. Well, why would the core of the universe be love? Because this thing has been always told to people, from heaven God loves you, all these people. See, if you're having a roaring love affair right now with somebody next to you, here, will you look up and ask for rays of love to come towards you? <laughs> I'm asking you. No, you made yourself in such a way nobody can love you. <laughs> now, only God can love you. 
If you say God loves me, you must know you are such a pathetic, despicable case. <laughs> if you made yourself in such a way, nobody can help loving you. You are a wonderful human being, isn't it? So when it… we need to understand there is something called human thought and emotion, human needs of emotional needs of love, care, touch, this. The cosmos or what you are referring to as the source of creation or divine or if you want to use the word God because God personifies thing, we will refuse to use that word. Let us say whatever is the source of creation which we are referring to as God generally by religious uh, this thing. Essentially… The question is, what means focus to you in, and which way can we apply focus in our daily life? So what's your definition of focus? Okay. Uh, there are many ways to describe this word. Instead of saying focus, if you use the word attention, would you agree that attention and focus are about the same thing? There is a little difference, there is… there are nuances to it. But when you say focus, it's just like focusing a light on something means only a focus is always a spot. Attention can be much more widespread. See, right now, if you have clear vision, I am having problems seeing the young man because you kept him in darkness there in the hall. <laughs> but if the hall was well lit, I don't have to focus myself to see the people who are sitting here. I just need attention. If I am attentive, I will see all the people here the way they are. But now I get interested in this one young man, then I need focus. If I had only focus without the general attention about everything around me, indiscriminate attention I'm talking about, attention not even about something, just being attentive because only because there is a certain level of attention and awareness within you, you even know that you exist. Otherwise, let's say in sleep, in your experience, neither the world exists nor you exist, all that's happened is there is no attention, because there is no attention, there is no perception of any kind. He knows his strength is gone on the football field, because there are younger boys who are running. So you have not seen Messi or Ronaldo in all the games. It is just that, who is able to extract the best out of the given situation? Namaskaram Sadhguru, you are a football fan. In your view, who is better between Messi and Ronaldo? See, this is the whole thing. On a given day, maybe I can play better than Messi. But that doesn't make me better than him because he's got… he's climbed through the steps, all right? One ball, if he kicks into the goal, it may go above the goal. If I kick, it may go in. So I'll say, I'm better than Messi. It doesn't work like that. So it's not who is better than whom, it is just that who is able to extract the best out of the given situation. Well, because you're talking about an international game, Messi has had the fortune, I would say to win that game. Because as everybody could see, he's lost his pace, still got fantastic skills, but he doesn't have speed, he's not able to run with the young boys, not able to retain the ball, but he's very good. So he realizes that he's not a fool to try to outrun those young boys and kill himself. He's just giving the necessary passes and making the difference. That's a smart man, isn't it? Very smart man. He's not thinking I should score. He's just making sure the ball is in the right place so that somebody scores. So he's using his skills. He knows his strength is gone on the football field because there are younger boys who are running, you know, always two, three steps ahead of him. So this whole thing about… Now what you're asking is, is a jasmine flower better or a rose flower better? So you've not seen Messi or Ronaldo in all the games. If you see both of them in variety of club games that they've played, which is where their skills were largely exhibited, in international games they're little out of place. 
because it's not their regular teammates. And uh, international games are a little rougher, not by the rule, because national emotions are there. These fine players cannot play very well there. Ruffians play better. <laughs> Very fine players cannot play very well in international games. In the club games, everybody is a professional. They play a certain level of game, there they will excel. So both of them have excelled beautifully in their clubs. Well, sometimes when you made a wrong choice of entering a wrong club and stuff, even if you're a great player, say Ronaldo sits on the bench in Manchester, Manchester United, because issues, other issues other than football will come up. Ronaldo did his best, but towards the end, he could not do his best because he couldn't handle the situations and the realities of life at the age of thirty-seven, what he should be. I think Messi handled that situation of his age gracefully and I think it paid off for him. And it's not all in his hands, the team and the situations, the opposition teams, many, many things are there. So if you want to see in the finals, is Bappe better or Messi better? Bappe is way better, he's playing like Pele, all right? But things didn't work, things didn't work, he's only twenty-three. He's moving faster than almost anybody in the entire tournament, but couldn't win. In the end, that's all that matters. This is what you need to understand, what we are doing in our lives is not all ours. Many things are there, it's happened to you many times, you hit the tree but it went on the green. Oh, that's how you win <laughs> It happens. You hit, you think you hit a great shot, but it bounced somewhere else. You hit a bad shot, but it came back where it should be. Well, all these factors are there. So don't go looking for luck hitting the trees. No, you do your best. What happens is not all yours. That goes for even the best champions of champions, all right? No question. So it's not right at any time that you don't pose this question even to yourself, am I better than the guy who's sitting next to you? Don't do this. What is the best I can do? That's all.